for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We're filming on site today at Coquitlam City Centre Library, and we thank the library for allowing us this venue to carry out the interviews. I'd also like to acknowledge that our interviews are taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to protect the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So joining us today is Rick Glumack, who is the BC NDP candidate for Port Moody Coquitlam. So thank you so much for joining us today, Rick. Great to be here. Thank you. Can you start us off just by giving us a little bit of background about yourself and why you're running for that BC NDP? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so my journey to politics uh, kind of took a, a roundabout route, I guess. Like, um, I grew up in a small town on Vancouver Island, Port Alberni. Um, I spent a lot of time in the uh, in the forest with my dad. He he worked. Oh, nice. uh, he worked for the uh, for McDonald Bodell mm -hmm. in in the forestry industry, and uh, so he knew all the all the gravel road, all, where where to go to go to all the lakes and all the rivers. And I spent a lot of my my younger years um, fishing and hiking in in the wilderness. Looking and for chanterelles. Looking for chanterelle <laughs> mushrooms, yeah, yeah, and uh, and and fishing, and um, and it, it was a, really a wonderful uh, way to kind of grow up and be connected, you know, to, to your, to your home in, in a real way. And, uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> that always stuck with me and it, and it's kind of like, that's kind of what, what drove me into politics. Um, but basically I went, I went to school, uh, at SFU for electronics engineering. Um, I went down, uh, I worked on the first computer animated, uh, TV show reboot. I, I went down and worked on Shrek 2 in Madagascar. Oh, ones yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, and so it was pursuing a career in in the in in that field and and, and video games as well and uh, but then my daughter was born in LA and you know thinking about you know what kind of life she would have growing up um, it made me kind of reprioritize like what I wanted to do and I moved back up to Van Vancouver at that point I actually moved in to Port Moody at that point um, and, and I wanted, I wanted, you know, I wanted my kids to grow up in, uh, with, with a connection to nature in the way that I had it. And, um, and what was, a wonderful place to come to. Yeah, exactly. And, and Port Moody, especially, right? Like mm -hmm. there's so many wonderful places to go around Port Moody and still be kind of close to, uh, you know, urban, an urban environment and everything. Uh, it's, it's really a kind of the best of both worlds. Um, but, uh, you know, when I came back, I remember the BC Liberal government at that time um, was basically privatizing our uh, BC Hydro uh, and, right. and, and damming up rivers for energy, but paying like exorbitant amounts of money to private companies to do this, so it was environmentally questionable in, in some of these, some of these, and and then financially questionable, and it, it because of my connection that I developed when I was younger to to rivers, especially, I, I got involved in in this and really started learning about this and, and how the environmental assessment process works in BC, and you know, you know, helping to organize people to be knowledgeable about this as well. And a lot of people cared about this. Like a lot of people, um, especially the Upper Pitt River, mm -hmm. um, they they uh, they went to these environmental assessment hearings and spoke from the heart about what these rivers mean to them. There were there were like seniors, there was young people, people from all walks of life, sports fishermen, First Nations people, all coming together. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in this one environmental assessment hearing, um, uh, and and hearing so many people speak and I spoke and, and it was just overwhelming. The next day the government canceled that project. There was just so much backlash and it, and it, and it really made me feel like, you know, people uh, can do a lot when they come together and, and, and people can make a difference. And that's kind of like what made me start believing in what politics is. That's, I've always felt like it's all about people. 
right? And uh, so that was not when I ran provincially, but, but that always stuck with me, that, that experience. And I started, you know, being more involved in my community, uh, you know, volunteering and things like that. I ended up running for city council, got elected there. And, and then 2017, I, I saw that there was an opportunity to, to bring, bring the, this to a, to a bigger level, my involvement in politics and have an impact provincially. And I really felt like um, the BC NDP was a party mm -hmm. for, for the people and really was fighting for people, like everyday people. And that's why, that's why I decided to run and I got elected in 2017 and my experience uh, in the NDP has been incredible in terms of that connection. I've always had that connection uh, to, to the grassroots of the community and always I've been holding town hall meetings throughout my term as, 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 a, as an MLA and I, I hope we have the opportunity to continue doing what we're doing. Yeah, well thank you for the work that you've done so far. Um, we're going to cover a bit of ground today, and um, one of the things that we're going to just start off with is talking a little bit about health care. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that's, I think, on a lot of people's minds. We have basically, I think, a world-class health care system here, but it's starting to show some really significant signs of strain. Uh, what has the NDP done about that? What have you done to recruit and retrain, retain doctors? Um, and also to reduce wait times. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, a lot of these, it, it's not that this is happening recently, that a lot of these problems developed over 16 years of BC Liberal government and underinvestment in healthcare. It really makes a difference where the government prioritizes investment and they did not prioritize it in healthcare, despite the fact that we have an aging population and there's immigration and everything else, right? So. What we've uh, focused on is um, um, bringing more healthcare professionals into the system because that's what's that's what's that's what's our challenge really. Is How are we, you bringing them in? Where are they coming from? From a number of different sources. So, for example, family doctors. Um, people have had challenges finding finding family doctors again. Um, what we did is we we worked with. Uh, family doctors and signed a new contract for them. We really listened to you know, what, what they were saying in terms of what the challenges were in opening up a new practice and all of that. And we, and we created a, we worked together to create a contract that works for family doctors. So and they were consulted as part of this. Absolutely, negotiations and, and consultation and, and really listening. I and mean, that's the key. And it's been incredibly successful. In the last year, we've hired over 800 um, new family doctors. In BC? Yeah. Wow. And so this is just the first year of a new contract. Uh, we, we, uh, we hope to see this kind of growth continue. So that, that, that's one thing, but also international credentialing. We, right. We've hired, um, we streamlined that process, both for nurses and, and for doctors. And we've hired, uh, I think, 900, um, 900 uh, nurses. Uh, no, no, sorry. 900 uh, internationally trained doctors have been hired and 2,000 internationally trained nurses. And that's part of um, a, a hiring of 6,300 uh, nurses in total over the last, uh, I believe the last year. Um, so there's been a lot of hiring going on and this is, this is how we address the problem. Because it's not just doctors, it's the nurses, it's the technical staff as well, so we need more of everybody. And yeah. it, okay, so that's good to hear some actions that have been taken. Absolutely. Um, in your own riding of Port Moody, Coquitlam, what have you done to ensure that your own constituents have access to quality health care? Mm -hmm. Well, um, when I first got elected, um, there was a plan by the previous government, for example, to sell off land around Eagle Ridge Hospital. Uh, the previous government uh, liked to sell off public land. It was kind of the thing that they did to try to get money and because they weren't running things uh, financially very well and so they, they, they resorted on selling public, basically our public, publicly owned land that we all, um, that we all own uh, to, to try to pay for things, right? And, um, but when we, when we became government, uh, uh, I talked to uh, the Minister of Health and we both agreed like that, that, that was very short-sighted. 
to sell land around the hospital without a plan in place yet to expand that hospital. You have an increasing population. We right? have such, um, such a fast growing population in our region and we need to be responsible and not just uh, like, like, like what they were doing is trying to find like on a Excel spreadsheet somewhere, public land, like let's sell that mm -hmm. off. Like we need, we need to preserve public land for things like this. They sold off schools, they, so many schools, like how much growth there is in, in my community. They sold off schools in my community and, in, and in, in, you know, where I know for a fact it's, it's going to be a challenge to, um, you know, um, find land if we need it again. Once they're sold and developed or whatever happens to them, it's impossible to pull it back, right? Yeah, especially so, with, you know, with property prices where, where they're at, like it's very short, mm -hmm. again, short-sighted plan it's like quick money from uh, right. you know the, the bc liberal government is thinking oh we'll make some quick money here. The here don't even think like two years in advance of what impact it's going to have on our community and our our uh, our future um so we stopped the sale of that land um and we you know we we expanded the emergency room and at eagle, at eagle ridge, ridge. Ridge. ridge yeah and and uh and we need to develop a plan for uh, further expansion of that hospital, but one other thing we did in the meantime, um, uh, I managed to get uh, an urgent and primary care center in Port Moody. Uh, that took a bit of work because I, I worked with the city um, to try to find a suitable place uh, within Port Moody. Um, there weren't any existing places, but there were developments that were coming in, uh, that were going to be completed that were perfect and we found one and that's where we have an urgent primary oh, care center now yeah and can you tell us what happens at the prime urgent and primary care center like yeah what, yeah what well, kind of services do you get there well it's kind of i mean it's it's urgent care yeah. and it's primary care so so it has it's a team-based approach to medicine so doctors nurse practitioners and, and nurses and other uh other um experts in the uh, that have different expertise in, in, uh, in medicine are there um, okay. and they do work together as a team. Um, um, so, you know, the typical experience of someone that goes to an urgent primary care center, like uh, if you have an, a fairly urgent issue, but it's not an emergency issue, oh, you, you, okay. can, you can go right. in and, and get evaluated by a nurse. And, you know, if you need to, to speak to a doctor, they, they usually can try, they can uh, schedule it kind of later in the day. So you don't have to wait around all day like you do in an emergency right. room. Okay. Um, it's a great system. But I see some advantages already yeah. from what you said there. Yeah. Um, is there a plan to expand those sorts of facilities throughout the province? Absolutely, yeah. We have, we have a plan for building urgent and primary care centers all over the province. And we've already built, uh, uh, I don't know the exact number, but quite a few. Okay. And, um, and we're working on funding uh, you know, uh, resourcing, staffing them uh, across the province, and that goes back to the, the work that we're doing in, um, in hiring new doctors and nurses, so, okay. yeah. And we're going in the right trajectory on that, so. Okay, thanks for that. Um, can we talk about affordability a little bit? Now, we know that affordability is on everyone's mind, and it's getting harder and harder to make ends meet. What has the BC NDP done um, to make you know, life more affordable for all of us. I mean, basically from the moment we became government, we looked at um, where the previous government was like, you know, charging fees for, for different things and raising fees for different things. And, and that's where, you know, you nickeled and dimed here and there. It's not nickels and dimes anymore. It's actually quite an quite a impact to your pocketbook, right? So, so you're talking about taxes are low, but then we're paying for other things. They, they kind of hide, they were hiding taxes in MSP premiums. Right. Um, and like we, we had bridge tolls and... Um, I remember we, those, yes. We had, uh, you know, high uh, auto insurance rates, um, oh. ICBC. We had escalating uh, electricity uh, costs, BC Hydro. All of those things are, uh, we, took, we took a look at all of those things and, for example, reduced uh, ICBC premiums by about $500 on average per year with the, with the new um, um, restructuring of ICBC that, that David Eby was uh, instrumental in, in taking on. That was a, that was a big undertaking. To, to, I mean, ICBC, as you remember, David call, uh, referred to it as a dumpster fire because once he became 
you know, once he took on that file and looked at the, the books, it was like, it, it was not looking good. It was mismanaged. So were we drawing out of ICBC funds and using it exactly. for other things? And in B BC Hydro as well. This is, this is again, uh, financial mismanagement by the previous government. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, uh, they, they were also increasing hydro rates. We've kept hydro, hydro rates um, stable um, under the rate of inflation. Uh, and, and, uh, and like I said, eliminated the MSP premiums, el eliminated the bridge tolls. But not only that, um, when, you, when you look at it, all the kind of taxes that British Columbians are subject to, mm -hmm. we have reduced taxes for 98% um, of British Columbians um, since we've become government. And that's something that most people don't really think of when they think of the, the BC NDP. They think, oh, you're taxing, taxing, and everything. But it's not the case. It's just not the case. If you look at our budget, um, we have reduced um, taxes for the majority of people. The top two percent, we've increased taxes. Right. So, okay. but so the, people need to look at those numbers and understand. Exactly. I'll give you. I'll give you an example. A family of four, making a hundred thousand, sort of, sort of lower, mid lower income, uh, they pay thirty eight percent less tax wow, than under the BC Liberals. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And if you, if you drop down even further to 60,000, you're paying 98% less tax. So it's, it's very uh, tiered. Like it, it's a difference between progressive and regressive taxation, right. basically. It's a, the BC Liberals were, were very much about regressive taxation. Right. Yeah. So you're hitting the lower income proportionately harder than you are as you go up the income scale exactly. in a regressive tax. Exactly. Uh, can we talk about housing? Mm -hmm. Sorry. I know we're um, in the midst of a housing crisis and the provincial government has put in some new housing legislation. So um, it includes um, mandating minimum density requirements for all communities over a population of 5,000. Um, can you tell us how that is going to address our housing affordability crisis? Well, and there, there are many aspects of, of uh, the work that we're doing to, to create housing affordability. We have um, a BC Builds program um, and we have a new legislation that we've brought in that uh, uh, not only allows kind of more or permits more density around SkyTrain stations, but also um, in single family lots, being able to, to build um, multiple homes on a lot more, more uh, without as much bureaucracy and all of that. But, but we also are providing tools to municipalities to, for example, inclusionary zoning. Um, it used to be something like that um, would have to be negotiated uh, with, a, with a developer, but we provided tools to municipalities now to basically mandate a minimum amount of affordable housing in every new development. So you're mandating a minimum amount of affordable housing in development? If the municipality enacts that legis enacts that oh, bylaw, okay. then 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 they have the ability to require that. Yes. And that's a new bylaw. That's a new power, power. basically yeah. that municipalities have to to do that at the at the beginning of a of a development process rather mm -hmm. than negotiating it at the end. Um, right. Yeah, and you know, so so some municipalities like uh, City of Burnaby has has been able to do uh, a lot of the, this kind of inclusionary zoning, and so we hope to see more of that um, as we go. So. Are there any other any changes you'd like to see to the provincial housing legislation? Um, well, um, I think you know one of the things that I think is key in in growing a community is that uh, we also grow the infrastructure in a community. And um, I, I think, you know, we need to look at um, all of the different aspects of, uh, you know, like schools and right. hospitals and all that. And, and we've, we've done that in, uh, in, in my community. Like I mentioned, we have the urgent primary care center expansion of the emergency room. We're building a new uh, elementary school in Moody Elementary. Recreational facilities where we've uh, fund helped to fund a new soccer field in in Port Moody. Mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure is really important. Um, we've also we also have a a grant that we gave uh, to municipalities 
Um, Port Moody received a six, uh, almost seven million dollars in the Growing Community Fund. City. And that's to support infrastructure. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, th this is a key thing. Uh, if you, you can't just you can't just build housing, you have to have all of the infrastructure around it to support that. Right. And so, you know, I, I I think that's that's an area where where we can work um, to make sure that communities are supported. And and know it like that very. Very important, I think, in any kind of growing community. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's important. A very important aspect, of course, and also hopefully retention of trees um, and the urban forest. I hope we we see that as well. Mm -hmm. Can we maybe talk a little bit about the environment? Um, recently, we've heard well, we've heard that BC Conservatives are supporting Axe the Tax. So the federal Conservatives. Um, have that slogan now. BC Conservatives have sort of adopted it, and now we're hearing that the BC NDP would also support axing the tax, the carbon tax, if the federal government would allow it. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean the the way things have kind of gone with the federal government, um, uh, how they've handled the carbon tax federally in this sort of. Uh, inequitable way across across Canada it's created some real challenges I think um, and if you know if we do end up getting a new government uh, like if it's a conservative government and they don't support a carbon tax it, it's it's a it's it's a it's a challenging situation um, to to kind of uh, you know um, try to have ways of reducing emissions um, effectively when you know the rest of the country is going in a different direction so what i think uh, if that were to happen and you know this would only be if, if they uh, if this happened federally we would need to take a look at like what what is what's what new things can we put in place right. to support um, emissions reductions in a more effective way maybe um, because we're not backing away from that in any way whatsoever. Like we are, we are doubling down on the fact that you know, especially um, you know, uh, big industrial emitters, they they uh, they have uh, legislative caps on on what they're allowed to emit, and um, and uh, part of our whole Clean BC program, there there are so many different programs in place to reduce emissions and uh, across industry, and, and we need to build on that. Our commitment. To reducing greenhouse gas emissions is not in any way diminished by just changing a policy, you know. Okay. So. Okay. No. Good. Good to hear that. Um, also, um, staying with the environment for a little bit longer, the BC Green Party has said that they will not support any foss new fossil fuel infrastructure and instead want to make BC um, a clean energy powerhouse. The BC Conservatives, sort of going on the other end of the spectrum, say. They see BC as a resource superpower. So, what is the NDP's plan for a healthy, sustainable economy? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it is interesting to to hear you know the BC Conservative position, which is basically their their leader does not acknowledge climate science in any way. Mm -hmm. um, well, he was removed from the BC Liberal Party when it was Liberals back in twenty twenty two, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because he he posted something online about questioning climate science, and he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't step away from that position. Um, he firmly questions it. He do, he doesn't believe that. I don't think he believes that CO two is responsible for for okay. climate change. We could have a, a premier in this province that questions climate science. It's unbelievable to me. That to me is a astonishing too that yeah. i mean we have to look at the science right uh, if we're not guided by <laughs> scientific consensus internationally then what is what's guiding him Who like knows where we'll go yeah is he guided by you know podcasts or i don't know like it, it, know. it's it's uh it's 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 to me it's just unbelievable and uh and you know not like there's so much opportunity in, in being um, on the forefront of clean energy. Because the world is moving in, mm -hmm. whether John Rusted likes it or not, we're, we're moving towards um, a clean energy. So what are economy. some of our clean energy options or plans? Mm -hmm. 
Well, we have uh, $36 billion we're investing in BC Hydro. Um, 10 billion of that is toward elect electrification. And uh, so we're preparing our, our province when for- When you talk about electrification, is that like for electric vehicles or what is electrification? Yeah, and moving more towards uh, electricity as, as a source of energy rather than fossil fuels okay. and, and making sure we have the infrastructure in place to support that. We're also doing a call for, for new um, uh, sustainable energy projects. Um, and we, I think it's like three, thousand gigawatt hours per year uh, that we're looking for by, I think we're, um, by 2028. So the, the clean energy, the sustainable energy projects, the reason we're able to do so much like that and we can do a whole lot more is because we have so many legacy dams in British Columbia that basically work as a battery to store energy that may not be needed when um, uh, a, a, a sustainable energy project uh, is generating energy. So. Um, you know, like uh, solar, you may need the energy more in in a certain part of the day than than when you would get it. Uh, so you can you can you can store that energy um, by not release and not running the turbines in a dam, and then and then release it later when it's needed. And you, you know, so it, we have uh, incredible ability to balance. So these are dams that already exist. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And they're throughout the province. Yeah, all over the province we have these dams that were built many decades ago, uh, the majority of them, and, and uh, it, it, it gives us an incredible advantage over almost any other jurisdiction in North America in terms of our ability to utilize sustainable um, uh, energy, That's clean energy. And you know. they're operational or close to being operational? It, I mean, you know, there's dams that are built in the 50s and 60s that are are still, you know, they're there and they're generating energy, and, and there's, there's some we're putting more turbines into and things like that. So. Um, yeah, no, it's very exciting. They, I've been personally involved with um, uh, our, our hydrogen. Um, I was going to ask you about hydrogen. What's yeah. happening with that? Well, there's a lot of exciting momentum behind hydrogen right now, green hydrogen. Um, for like, I, I work in this uh, role in government uh, and as a premier's liaison to the Pacific Northwest, so I, I have a lot of um, involvement in. Um, you know, and understanding of what's going on in, in some of the states. That's cross-border. Yeah, so Washington State, Oregon, and, um, we, the, in, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, they have um, a hydrogen hub that they'd like to build uh, where they're, we're anticipating a uh, billion dollars uh, U.S. of investment from the Inflation Reduction Act to support um, building, um, building that hydrogen hub. And, and where would it be? It's a kind of distributed kind oh. of in different areas. I guess it's a it's a hub of of companies basically that uh, are to utilize um, hydrogen. Um, but in British Columbia, we have a company called HTech that uh, has um, also um, been able to get funding for and quite a bit of funding for uh, hydrogen production. So we have a, a good a good fit between our two jurisdictions in terms of uh, creating green hydrogen and 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 maybe um, exporting some of it and using it locally. So you can export it. Okay. So where is the funding coming from? Uh, well, there's there's investments, um, there's grants and things like that 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 they that they've received and also private investment, federal. There's some federal funding. Um, but what I've been able to do through my work at the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, I was president of that organization um, for the last year, and uh, we we put a, um, a study together, uh, and it's it's funded on both sides of the border. This is the first time anything like this has nice ever happened. Nice to see some cross-border collaboration, exactly. maybe some synergy happening yes. there. Yeah. yeah. Washington State and BC have so much synergy, we do. you know, in we so many different money. areas. And so we, we funded this on both sides of the border and we're looking at uh, this study, which will be completed by the end of the year, which will give recommendations to both jurisdictions on how to uh, maximize our opportunities in the hydrogen economy. So it's very exciting. And, it sounds yeah. like there's some exciting things on the horizon. Um, can you just maybe Give a quick summary and tell us what's at stake with this election coming up on October 19th. Well, I, I, I think there has never been 
a starker contrast between parties in an election in BC ever. We we have a um, we, in BC we used to you know the center left center right kind of right. you know but we're looking at center left and very right wing policies like it, you you look at what what the BC Conservatives are rolling out in their campaign and it's just they're it's this simplistic messaging but fiscally um, just completely irresponsible tax cuts and all of this that to a level that we would be sacrificing probably our, our entire um, health care system would not be able to fund it um, in the way that we need to be um, in in the coming years so the way that we have been as as a party like like we talked about earlier like investing in health care professionals we're also building a new um, medical school in British Columbia it's the first medical school That's Simon Fraser yeah mm -hmm. the first medical school in Western Canada in 50 years it's a big investment a big investment a great yeah. investment into our future yeah. and and all of this is at stake like uh, how governing uh, a province responsibly caring for each other uh, in in as we move into the future moving into the future together not just looking for you know uh, quick slogans in an election where you could where you could like uh, talk about this this tax cut that tax cut tax cuts are great and we've been doing them we've been doing them as as a party but they have to be done responsibly we've had a balanced budget um, almost every year that we've been in government and and you know we've had some challenges recently but we're getting back on track and we just need the time to do that so what's at stake is I mean think about it. Think about if you have a government, like first of all, there's, there's only eight of them, eight MLAs in the Conservative Party that have any experience in government whatsoever. And they were all part of the, I think they were all part of the, most of them were part of the Christy Clark government. Oh, um, okay. You know. Great, okay. So, so what's at stake is, is um, a party that has very little experience. They're, they're making irresponsible promises in this campaign. And what will that translate to? for your future, like for education. When, when the previous government, the BC, the BC Liberals, took teachers to court to, to, to fight them in the Supreme Court, that, that's what we're going to be facing again. Um, challenges to education, challenges to healthcare, challenges to childcare, these are investments that we're making. Across the board, our future is at risk, I think, if we get a conservative government in this province and I hope that um, we don't. Well Rick thank you so much for coming in and, and sharing that with us it was great to talk to you. Um, thanks for joining us we've been speaking with Rick Glumack who is the NDP candidate for Port Moody Coquitlam and so remember to get out and vote on October 19th. Thank you.